Hi everyone, my name is Monique. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And Happy New Year Happy to New Year. you all, wherever you are. Uh, we really hope that your year has started off bright. Yes, we wanted to say Happy New Year before it was socially unacceptable to say it. Yeah. I think for me, that's about two weeks into the year. Oh, good. Yeah, so I <laughs> we're think we still, got it. Yeah. still in that window. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're wrong about that, let us know <laughs> when <laughs> that is for you. But uh, before we officially kick off 2024 for our channel, we wanted to discuss our top 10 favorite new to us games from 2023. That's right. So these are games that, uh, like she said, are new to us, meaning they could have come out back in 2023 or any time before that. Mm -hmm. So this list is going to be kind of a hodgepodge of those different dates. Yes, we're going to be talking about 10 games. We will have some runners up as usual. Mm -hmm. And also, as per usual, if we have any items on our list that we've been sponsored to play on our channel in the past, we will discuss them sure. uh, when we get there. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the list. Uh, we have a couple of honorable mentions. Mm -hmm. Now, this one in particular was one that we were sponsored on a live stream with Watch It Played. Mm -hmm. uh, that took place back in the summer last year. And this is a game called Gussie Gorillas. Yes. This is a game from Bytewing Games designed by Nick Murray. And uh, this is a real-time negotiation game where you never know exactly what you are negotiating away. Yeah, so you I, actually didn't read the whole title. Oh, it's go ahead, please. Gussie Gorillas, a primate game of blind negotiation. So that, that tells is the, you a lot. <laughs> that's the entire game yeah. right there. So you are a primate. You are blindly negotiating cards that with have other different, primates. different... Yeah, with other primates, <laughs> your, your opponents. Uh, you have a stack of cards that are face down. You have no idea uh, what the values are that you are going to be negotiating away. So everything is done kind of Hanabi style where you know what you're trying to uh, acquire from somebody else but you have no idea what you're giving away. Mm -hmm. uh, this game is, is a riot. I really had a lot of fun with it. Um, and that's why it is an honorable mention right now. Yes, well, actually it's an honorable mention because um, as you'll see with my pick, these are party games. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, these are not easily, uh, I guess, playable at two. No. And yeah. we don't typically play a whole lot of party games. So these two games in particular made a mark. This game plays three to 10 players, right. and there's a lot of different effects that the cards can have. Mm -hmm. uh, what we described was sort of just the surface of how you play the game. But if you, if you want to see it in action, we do have a video on the Watch a Play channel mm -hmm. that fully demonstrates at the six player account what this looks like. Yeah, I'll leave a link to uh, specifically our playthrough of this in the description down below mm -hmm. if you want to check this game out. So that is one of our honorable mentions. That is Gussie Gorillas. Similarly, my honorable mention is also a party game that we were sponsored to play on the Watch a Play live stream. And it is called That's Not a Hat. <laughs> so this is a game that was designed by Casper Lap. It's uh, published by Ravensburger. And this is a memory game. Oh, yeah. But it's hilarious because it's a game all about gifting. You know, that was that was a very uh, common theme in the past month, right? It we was, had the yeah. holidays. Holidays, yeah. <laughs> so basically, this game just has a deck of cards that have very simple drawings on them. It's like I mean. childlike stick figure drawings. Yeah. If yeah. you had to draw a hat really quickly... That's what it would look like, like a doodle. What, these, what these cards are. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, everybody has a gift face up in front of them to start the game. And whoever starts the game draws a card from the top of the deck, announces what it is to everybody, puts it face down in front of them, and then gifts it, mm -hmm. depending on where the arrow is pointing on the card. Right. And whoever receives the gift must then decide if they'd like to keep it or not. Uh, at the start of the game, everybody's going to be keeping their gifts. But eventually, you're going to have to gift cards that are face down. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> you're sort of going to start losing track of what cards had what items because things will be getting gifted back and forth because there these might... arrows are not just going to make you gift in one direction. And um, as soon as you think, wait... Naveen said he was gifting me a bell, but I, I I'm pretty sure it's a hot dog. remember <laughs> that that person over there has the bell. This yeah. is something else. Yeah. You can refuse the gift, and if they were incorrect, whoever was incorrect takes it as a penalty point. Yeah. So it's it is hilarious. Very simple game, uh, but very hard to keep track, especially when you play with five or greater players. Yes. Um, as cards start getting shifted around, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I know that's the bell, that's the hot dog, that's the skateboard. <laughs> oh, no. I'm what up on it? deck. What is the one yeah. I have to give up? Because uh, the thing is, if you uh, give up and you say the wrong thing and yeah. they call you out on it, now you take that into your score pile and it's a negative point for you. Right. And as soon as you, somebody hits three penalty points, then that's when the game ends. And whoever has the lowest score <laughs> is, the, is the winner. Yeah. So it is really, really uh, a fun and funny game to play. Um, it, it is a memory game through and through. So you sort of have to know your interest in that sense. I sure. love memory games yeah. because I think they're just funny. <laughs> yeah. Because it's so hard to be good at them, right? There's moments also if you're playing multiple rounds, yes. meaning uh, that sometimes there's that memory of like, wait, was that image in this, this game? game? <laughs> or was that in the 
Oh, no, that was in the last game. Yeah. You know, so uh, it makes it uh, a lot more challenging when you play multiple games back to back. Yes. So anyway, that is uh, That's Not a Hat. This is my runner up. And also uh, a game that we played on the live stream. So we do have a full playthrough of yeah. it on Watch It Played. I'll leave a link. There you go. Now, before we get into the full 10 list, we do have one more runner up. We do. And the reason yeah. why we wanted to add it to this list is because it was a Kickstarter that has not fulfilled yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we realized that when we play a game that was for a Kickstarter, we typically don't return to it later on. So we wanted to make sure we mentioned it the year that we were able to play it. Yeah, about four and a half years into the channel, we're noticing that it's like, we're not adding games to the list be when after the finally fact. Released. Yeah, so yeah. This is a good time to probably talk about it. Yes, and so this is a game that was designed by Vital Lacerda and published by Eagle Griffin Games. Mm -hmm. You probably know what it is. It was called Invention. Yes, Invention so, Evolutions of Ideas, I think. Evolutions of Ideas? Something like title? that. Yeah, I think that's the full title. That was a game that was on Kickstarter this past year. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I when we played it, I really, really had a great time with it. Oh, yeah. I mm -hmm. felt like it was a return to some of his other designs that uh, that really brought me into heavy gaming. We really enjoyed playing that one. Like yeah. all, the, all the plays leading up to it. This is a very, very heavy, uh, heavy in the sense that um, very complicated, very kind complicated, of uh, yeah. convoluted style of game. He's one of our favorite designers, mm -hmm. Monique's favorite designer. And so uh, we always love playing uh, his games, especially in the, in the primitive stage, I guess you could say, in the mm -hmm. Kickstarter stage. So yeah. Uh, we just wanted to kind of mention this one because it's one that we really, really enjoyed. And we're excited to see yeah. the final production copy. So that was our other honorable mention, Inventions. All right. Are you ready to get into the list? Yes, let's do it. Okay, so uh, these 10 games, this is going to be a combined list mm -hmm. since we like pretty much the same types of games. Um, we have kind of negotiated which 10 belong in this list for us so that we can be very happy with it. And we'll let you know if one game was more heavily weighted towards one person over the other. Exactly. So... Number 10, this is a card game that was introduced to me mm -hmm. at a local convention. It is a game called Inheritors. Yeah. Now, we have not covered this on the channel in like a playthrough uh, fashion. I find that this game plays best at three or four players. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't really highlight, we couldn't really highlight the game to play it at uh, two. Uh, this one is now published by North Star Games. I, it's escaping me who the original publishers were. Uh, and it's designed by Jeffrey CCH as well as Kenneth YWN. Uh, in this game, the king has gone missing, and it is your job to try to inherit the throne. Mm -hmm. Not to look for the king at all, but just to inherit it, to take it out from underneath them. Uh, this is kind of a Lost City style game where you are going to be trying to set collect the most of a specific type of color mm -hmm. by trying to play cards in ascending order. Um, how else do I describe this game <laughs> in a fast uh, I mean, way? there's a lot of things that you could do in the game. Mm -hmm. It is surprisingly, there's surprisingly a lot more to it than it looks. It's a small box and mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a card game through yep. and through. But there's a market dynamic where you're exchanging it, cards yeah. with the market. Mm -hmm. There are cards that give you certain powers that allow you to exchange for certain cards that you need because you are basically trying to play cards in front of you to your own tableau in numerical ascending order. order. Yep. And uh, at the end of the game, those are going to be able to score you points. But you're also trying to attract the different uh, clans, I think, yeah. that are in the game. And, like, there's public objectives also yeah. for meeting certain criteria. So everybody mm -hmm. knows, like, be the first person to get to uh, number four in a certain color. Yeah, or right. have three threes in, in three different colors. And then you can meet that public objective mm -hmm. to score more victory points. Exactly. So it's all about the card play. And mm -hmm. that market is such a huge aspect of the game. Because everything else is just goals uh, that you're trying to achieve when exchanging with the market. Mm -hmm. So like Naveen was mentioning, I, I do agree it plays better at higher player okay. counts, mm -hmm. but it was a very nice surprise. I think we've yeah. covered this on maybe a Let's Talk board games mm -hmm. in the past. Yep. But if you're curious, this was definitely more heavily weighted towards Naveen. He really played it, it. Yeah. at a convention that I wasn't able to attend and came home and raved about it. And now it is here on our list. It is <laughs> so. here to stay as well. Yes. Yeah. So that is number 10. That is Inheritors. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to number nine. This is a Reiner Knizia game that I think was new to us in 2023. I, I want to say it was. We could be wrong. Yeah. But it's published by Cosmos, and it's a game called My City. Yeah. So this game was definitely not released in 2023. This is a little bit older, but not too old. Yeah. And it is a campaign style, uh, campaign legacy style game. About city building. Building up your own cities with polyomino tiles. Tile bling, yeah. There's a story to it. It gets <laughs> wild. Like you look at it and you, every each player has their own board and each player has their own set of the same polyomino tiles. But there's this story about how you, <laughs> you're trying to found this city and yeah. you're, you're Industries building it Industries are coming in eventually. Yeah. I don't want to give away because it is a technically a legacy, technically style, legacy game. style game. It's uh, a legacy style game. But 
the game you play, uh, it's very simple at, at first. It's basically mm -hmm. a flip and lay game. Yeah, it's that? a deck yeah. of cards that yeah. show the polyomino tiles that right. everybody's going to be required to place in your city. Yeah. So everybody pretty much follows the same rules, but it's the decisions that you make when placing them in your city that impacts the rest of the game. Yeah, the game is broken so, down into, I think, uh, eight chapters, and each chapter there's like three different three games. Uh, games in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the very beginning of every game of the chapter, there's a certain set of rules or certain criteria for... Justif justifying why you're going to lay out your polynominals in a certain mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, you know, th and there's also rules about, you know, placing your polynominals uh, next to each other mm -hmm. or surrounding a certain type of structure mm -hmm. or right. avoiding getting into the river, things like that. So it's really, really fun. We've had a lot of fun playing it. Um, yeah. We've been doing a, uh, a couple of live streams of this actually on our Patreon. That's right. Uh, intermittently. But that, that yeah. is why we started playing it in yeah. the first place. We had this and we thought, what was what is something that we can sort of do uh, long term across the span, spanning the entire year, mm -hmm. even though we haven't finished it yet. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> we have, we try to do like a every other month live stream with our Patreon community mm -hmm. where we play through my city yeah i think we have so, maybe a couple more to do we do yeah. it's been very fun uh for anybody out there who is interested in polyomino games and if you enjoy legacy style games which basically means it's a campaign game that changes forever mm -hmm. uh check out my city yeah there is uh, a follow-up to this called Why Island yeah. that we haven't played yet. Which was on our uh, most anticipated of 2023, mm -hmm. knowing that we enjoyed the first initial plays of My City. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I'm excited to play that one also because they wouldn't just do the same game over. Again, <laughs> would they? they would have to change no, it up a, a little bit. It's an island now. I guess. So anyway, that is my number nine, My City. Yes. Moving on to number eight, just a quick disclaimer for this particular game. Monique did a sponsored tutorial for it, so we just wanted to let you know about that. Mm -hmm. This is a two-player only dice game called Sky Team. Mm -hmm. Now in this game, the theme is you are uh, working together cooperatively to try to land a commercial airliner. Uh, so there's a lot of little things that are going on in this game. You're gonna be using dice to take certain sets of actions and set up the plane for its approach towards a runway so you can safely land it. And by the way, this game was designed by Luc Ramond and published by Le Scorpion Masqué. And uh, we were actually very excited about this game from the moment that we heard about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think this was on our most anticipated games list of 2023. It was, To yeah. start the year. Yeah, two-player only cooperative mm -hmm. dice game. Yes. That sounds like right up our alley. And that was before we knew that we were going to be doing a tutorial video for it. So we were very honored to, be, to have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And we had a really, really great time playing it. So I know that uh, on our tutorial video, a lot of people were like, there's a lot of ways to lose. And, <laughs> and you, you immediately can't talk. lose the game. Yes, it is tough. Like these rules are in place uh -huh. so that the game could exist and right. so that the game could be challenging. Yes. So I actually really appreciate those parts of the rules. I think that there might, people might feel like that maybe there's a thematic disconnect when it comes to some of that stuff. But sure. at the end of the day, it is still a game. That's right. And there are a lot of different scenarios that you can play. So once you've sort of played through the uh, the base game, I guess, then mm -hmm. there's a whole a lot of different modules that you can kind of mix and match to make the game more difficult. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we were both particularly very fond of this game. Um, there are still several scenarios that we have to figure out how to master. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not very good at it. <laughs> the ba it's hard. It's hard. It, it is tough. It, it is not easy, especially when you uh, yeah. you you think you're communicating right, right. Uh, but sometimes yes. you just sometimes you, you crash just and burn. Can't fly the plane. So, uh, but yeah, that is our number eight. That is Sky Team. All right, moving on to our number seven. Yep. Now, in 2023, we were fortunate enough to be able to travel to the Tokyo game market in Japan. And so this game is one that we were able to experience for the first time there. Mm -hmm. So we actually have two copies of the game because one version is a Christmas edition, and it is called Nana. Nana. So Nana is a very simple card game designed by Kaya Miyano with artwork from Sai Beppu. Mm -hmm. And in this game, you are basically just trying to create sets of three of the same number. You're trying to discover so, sets. Yeah. At the start of the game, everybody has a hand of cards. And before you start, you have to order your cards from lowest to highest. Mm -hmm. And on your turn, you're basically going to reveal cards from different areas uh, to try to have three of the same value. So there, there are also cards uh, on the table face down. So you can either reveal a card from there or you can ask somebody to reveal a card, but it must be either their highest value or their lowest value. Mm -hmm. And you can even reveal a card from your own hand. But again, as long as it's either the highest or the lowest value. So as an example, if I reveal my lowest value, which is maybe a three, mm -hmm. and I ask Naveen, 
uh, can you reveal your lowest value? And he also reveals a three. Mm -hmm. Then I can continue revealing cards until either I reveal one that is not a three or until I've completed a set. Right. If I was incorrect, then all of the cards go back to where they were. I would reflip over the one that's on the table. I would return the card to Naveen's hand. And now everybody has to remember where they saw these threes. Yeah, they would be like, well, I know Naveen's lowest card is a three. Because yeah. uh, if, so if you know where the other three is, the one that Monique couldn't reveal, mm -hmm. then maybe in, in your turn, you'd be like, well, Naveen, show me your lowest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. three then uh, maybe uh you have a three and then they know that you also have a three right and then there you go they were able to reveal three threes mm -hmm. and they put that in their scoring pile exactly and there are actually three different ways that you can win you can win from by either uh completing three sets mm -hmm. of three of the same value or you can do it by completing two sets as long as both numbers either add up or subtract to the number seven, right. which is why the game is called Nana, by Nana. the way, because Nana in uh, Japanese means seven. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a third way that you can win, and, and it's if you just collect three sevens, which yes. is the most difficult number to form because it's right in the middle. Right, because when you're yeah. asking your opponents to reveal either their highest or lowest, seven, it, it, you know, if you think about a chart, is going to mm -hmm. be in the dead center. So right. over time, it's going to kind of chip away and erode to finally get to that seven. So yes. there's kind of like this shoot the moon aspect of it it if you can whittle it down to get those three sevens mm -hmm. and you haven't been collecting any sets along the way so yeah it's uh, it's fun i i think it's best at uh, the higher player counts it plays two to five players mm -hmm. um because there's just more memory to kind of keep track of yeah uh, the memory aspect yeah. is is a large part of the game uh -huh. and it makes the game really funny because you have those moments where you flip over something and you're like wait <laughs> you know yeah. we played this game actually for the first time with amy and maggie from thinker themer uh -huh. and it was such a a, a hoot yeah I guess. <laughs> we, we were just laughing and laughing the whole way through and it's yeah. so simple it's so simple so small it's just so. it, there's sometimes like where you're just like i i know i i know exactly what i'm gonna do on my turn mm -hmm. so don't ruin it by asking somebody where their lowest card is right when, when i don't want you to tell anybody else or give that somebody else that information mm -hmm. because uh, sometimes especially early on in the game when you're going it alone and you're just asking people things and you're revealing cards you're just like oh no that was what I was going to ask on my turn, and I know exactly you know, what is going to score. So mm -hmm. really, really super uh, fun game, uh, very family-friendly. Uh, we have two different versions of it. The Christmas one adds an element yes. um, that is a little different than the standard. It does add a rule that's not in the, in the other game mm -hmm. uh, that has to do with gift, uh, gift giving mm -hmm. because there are gifts on the cards now. Yeah. And so. uh, this game uh, is now, I believe, published in English, and it's no longer called Nana, but I think if you search on BGG as Nana, it'll show up as whatever that new game is. Mm. So just a heads up. Well, there you go. That is our number seven. Thank you so much to Jay, actually, from Cardboard yeah. East, who put this game on our radar and our friend who gifted it to yeah, us. Yeah, we were actually gifted uh, market, uh, so. both of these copies by a friend who happened to be at the Tokyo Game Market. Yes. So thank you very much as well. Yes, we love them both. Our number seven, Nana. Moving on to number six. This is a game that we actually don't own. So here is a box of it right here. Uh, this is a game designed by Olivier Grégoire and published by Sit Down, and it is called Tiwanaku. Uh, so the games that uh, we've played of this have all been on BGA, Board mm -hmm. Game Arena, and this is... Well, that's not true. The very first... Th this is cheating a little bit. Okay, we're the cheating. The very first time we played this game was before it was released um, at Essen Spiel. That's they had true. a demo table of it. And that was we did, 2022, so maybe we, we are cheating here. We played the physical copy, but it was not called Tiwanaku at the I time. I think it was Pachamama, Pachamama is what it was called. Yeah. And it was a it was a scenario that was set up already about where the game is about two-thirds complete. Mm -hmm. So right. we wouldn't count that as technically... We, we, we flubbed a little bit, okay? <laughs> but we played this game a ton on BGA. On BGA, yeah. Uh, and essentially what this game is, is it is a memory deduction game, mm -hmm. would you say? Uh, memory part of it? Uh, it's a deduction, deduction game. game this mostly. is a deduction set collection style game. It has a bit of a learning curve before yes. you start playing it. But basically you have this board and you are trying to uncover the different fields and the crops that crops. go on top of them. Yeah, there's five different types of crops yeah. in the game. And it's very Minesweeper-esque where mm -hmm. um, if you know that there's a one somewhere, all in the eight boxes around that one, there will be no other one. Mm -hmm. there. One value, I mean. Right. Uh, and so um, there are... <laughs> uh, help <laughs> so me here. Hard to explain. How do you explain okay. this without looking at it? Okay. Oh my when gosh. you first start a scenario, yes. you're going to be moving yourself around the board. And each time you move on a space that nobody else has moved onto, uh -huh. you first uncover the field, which is the color of the square. And that's really important because uh, the, the fields are going to be anywhere from one to five in size. Mm -hmm. And they're 
are always going to be adjacent groupings in a field. And within the field, each value of crop will only be represented one once. Time. Yeah. So if the field is a size three, then you know you're going to have a one, two, and three valued Somewhere crop in there. there. Yeah. With those same rules that Naveen was mentioning, where the eight squares surrounding it are not going to repeat in number. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like Sudoku-esque, but Minesweeper, Minesweeper for sure. in deduction. But there's yeah. also another strategic layer where you are trying to uncover the fields in the, the same the same amount of fields per color mm -hmm. because there's a there's a whole scoring chart where if I uncovered my second blue field but I've also only uncovered two green fields then now I'll score two points something like that we don't want to confuse <laughs> that's, that's you the part that's tricky just know it's really fun yeah um, minesweeper like uh, as yeah. long as you like games of Discovery. Would you call that discovery? Deduction. Deduction. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to make it sound uh, easier than we've probably described it because it is a very complicated game to describe without actually physically with, to seeing describe it. without physically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is so addicting. If you like deduction style games, uh, super addicting. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, we are on Board Game Arena, uh -huh. and there was a, a period of time where it didn't have a, a premium membership, and that was the one game that I mourned. <laughs> Our because, premium membership lapsed yeah. for a, a small period of time, yes. and we didn't realize it, and we're like, oh, oh we, we can't play to play that again. <laughs> yeah. So, so definitely had to make an appearance on this list, but again, we only pretty much play it online because it randomizes the scenario. If you have the physical copy of the game, there is a there's like a physical machine that you have to sort of fiddle with in yeah. order to to get the answers. Not so much like Turing machine scenario. or anything like that, but some, no. a, a machine that's very cool, by the way, that like yeah. can actually give you the the results. Mm -hmm. um, but the online implementation is amazing. It's just so good. So because it, it does all that stuff for you. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that is our number six, probably the hardest one that we're going to be able to describe today. <laughs> that is Tiwanaku. All right, we are now halfway there, moving on to our number five. Now, this is the last game on this list that we have to make a disclaimer for. This was a game that we were sponsored to do a playthrough of. It was actually a part of a three-game video that mm -hmm. we did, which I think was the first time we've ever done that. Yep. And it is called Paolo Mori's Caesar. <laughs> Why? Uh, Paolo Mori's Caesar, it's called, <laughs> yes. Yeah. He is the designer That's of the game. Paolo Mori's Caesar. That's true, yeah. Sees Rome in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And that's about accurate because uh, this is a game for one to two players only, and it plays in about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. In fact, all of the games that were a part of the video that we did for this were about 20 minutes uh, in length, mm -hmm. and they were two player only games. It was Caesar, Dogfight, and Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg. Yep. This game is now being published by Floodgate Games, and if you're not familiar with it, in this game, there is a map. Uh, and it's full of provinces. The Roman in, Peninsula. In, yeah, the Roman Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And you're basically just trying to place your tokens on the in-between spaces of two provinces because each player has tokens that have two numbers on them, mm -hmm. and you're just trying to win a province by completely encircling it and having the highest value within a province. Yeah, it's, it's technically area math. control. Yeah. yeah, simple math. Uh, yeah. When, when uh, a province is completely encircled, mm -hmm. uh, whoever does do the final encircling of a specific pro uh, province is going to get that bonus that's listed there. So mm -hmm. I may not be the one winning it in terms of area control and scoring points, mm -hmm. but I might really want to close it out and be done with it because I really want that bonus that's on the inside there. Right. Uh, in addition, uh, like Monique said, each chit is double-sided. So maybe I have a token that is a five on one side and a one on the other. Mm -hmm. Then maybe I'll toss my one into the one I'm already losing anyway so I can get my five into a province that we're still competing over yes. so I can try to get scoring uh, in that particular province. Exactly. And whoever has the higher value when a province closes is the one who gets to place out their scoring marker. Mm -hmm. And there's also a chain, a chaining uh, bonus. If you're able to sort of uh, create a line of provinces that you win, then you can place out even more tokens. Right. And basically, whoever places out all of their tokens first wins the game. Yeah, it's a race so to get them out. It's a race to get them out. And it can be very, very tense because of that chaining and, and very strategic, but also very simple. Yeah. Because on your turn, you're just placing out one chit. And uh, possibly taking the bonus and seeing how that affects yeah. the board. But and a challenge in the game is you don't just have access to all your tokens. You have your tokens right. in a bag and you only have a certain set in, in front of you. So because the map is kind of littered with these different symbols, mm -hmm. maybe the tokens that you have uh, don't match exactly where you want to go. So you have to find clever ways to kind of get your tokens out, cycle through, get new ones in so that you can eventually kind of encircle the province. That's going to be really valuable for yourself. Anyway, that is our number five, Caesar. 
Number four on our list, this is a game uh, from Devere Games designed by Isra C. and Shay S. Mm -hmm. And it is called The White Castle. Yes. Uh, a lot of game in a small box, which mm -hmm. I do appreciate. Uh, we did do a playthrough of this game on the channel, so I will link it up here if you're interested in that. Uh, and this is uh, based off of the castle in Himeji called Himeji Castle. Yes, in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and basically, this is a game about uh, maximizing the amount of actions that you have. Oh, if yeah. you're a Euro gamer, uh, this one is a tight one. Mm -hmm. So basically, in this game, you are going to be drafting dice from the three different bridges that are on the board. But you can only draft the dice on either end the left of the, the right. bridge, yeah. the left or the right. And when you when you take the dice, you're going to place them in an available area, either on the main board, which has the different levels of Himeji Castle, or mm -hmm. on your own player board. And then you can resolve uh, the action that's there. And what you're basically trying to do is you're trying to get the three different types of workers in the game from your player board to the castle as well as the, the surrounding grounds. areas yeah. of the grounds. And at the end of the game, they'll score you points depending on how well you're able to do each one. I know that sounds very vague, <laughs> but it is, it is a game about comboing your actions yes. because you only have three actions per round, I believe it you're is. You're only guaranteed nine actions, but the, the goal of the game is to try to find a way to squeeze mm -hmm. those nine actions to get more actions by chaining uh, different things and setting yourself up for success mm -hmm. in the future rounds. The first couple uh, turns, you're going to be like, Oh man, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going out there. I'm getting one little I'm resource. Getting, yeah. But if you can set yourself up properly in this game and yes. kind of Euro manage yourself, uh, then it can pay dividends by uh, taking different actions uh, when you're taking a certain type of action. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> you're trying to train you're trying your to chain actions. Yeah. You're trying to create more tools for yourself at the right time so that when you take a certain action, it'll allow you to do something else in addition to that just that one thing. Yeah. Because it's just nine actions over the course of the game. First which time we is played, wild. I think I, I took maybe like 10 or 11 actions. I did not chain as much. And then so as you play it more and more, you start to unlock, oh, okay, if I put this person in the mm -hmm. garden and if there's a die left over because I don't think anybody's going to take that like useless black die at the end, then I'm going to get a little chaining bonus. And that chaining bonus will set me up for the next round because then I'll have the resource I need to then do X, Y, and Z. It's tough, yeah. uh, especially if you're used to playing the, the more modern Euro strategy games that kind of give you a lot of things. It's more sandboxy in that mm -hmm. sense. This is quite the opposite of that. Also, this game, the box says 80 minutes on it. And at a two-player game, if you really know what you're doing, you can really get through this kind of quick. Mm -hmm. I think now we it's get true. this game played in about 45 minutes. Setup is fairly straightforward. Also. It can be very quick. Yeah. So it's a lot of game in a very small box and uh, not too large of a time commitment. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that is our number four, the White Castle. All right, moving on to our number three. Now, in 2023, we also ended our Uwe Rosenberg designer series. And so, of course, uh, a couple of his titles might end up on this list. Sure. Yeah. So our number three was Uwe Rosenberg's Iranian Burger Canal. Oh, yes. This was a new to us game of last year, and it was a very pleasant surprise. Oh, yeah. We had no idea what to expect from this game. I think the first time we heard about it was from Essen Spiel the year before and then never got to play it until we were almost done with our series. We mm -hmm. actually weren't even sure if this would be able to make it uh, as a part of it. And so this is actually a one to two player only game uh, designed by Uwe Rosenberg, where you are trying to build up industries around the Iranian Burger Canal. So it's actually pretty straightforward and simple in design, but the more you play it, the more the strategies unravel because each player has their own player board where you are trying to build out these structures as well as the infrastructure around it. So you're trying to build out canals as well as railways. Paths, railways. And mm -hmm. each card gives you some sort of benefit depending on when the card actually activates. When you build the card, you don't actually get the effects of whatever the card says until you either completely surround it by uh, railways and or canals, or you build out a second bridge that connects the card to an adjacent card. So that is where the theme sort of plays in. You're trying to build out this infrastructure, but it's all about timing and planning. And I think that the game is super interesting in that sense. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also one of those games that you are managing your own resource wheel. So if you're familiar with other uh, Uwe Rosenberg title mm -hmm. like uh, what's Aura et Labora, Glass Road, mm -hmm. things like that, where you have kind of this this resource wheel. You always find yourself in this game like just one Need brick, one <laughs> just one brick to do something yeah. really great. And so uh, it, this is, uh, t is it technically, it's not like a worker placement game. You know, that there's there's a stack of coins. Mm -hmm. uh, so on your turn, you're basically going to take this stack of, uh, of coins and you're going to place it out onto a, an action spot. And that action spot is going to dictate what kind of actions you're going to take or what kind of uh, resources uh, you're going to take during that action. 
Uh, and so there's kind of this like fine balance of like, I'm not ready to take that action. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, because it's only a two player game, hopefully I can take this action. Monique will just need to not go to that one action spot mm -hmm. right there so that on my next turn, I can take that spot and then do something really glorious. Right, right, right. Um, so obviously it never works out that way because <laughs> she can see exactly what I'm trying to do. Um, but, but there's kind of this element also uh, in any given round, one player is going to be able to take three actions and the other player will only be able to take two actions. So mm -hmm. if you, on your turn, you are going to be the person that's taking um, only two actions, then you know in the very next round you can set yourself up to be able to take three actions. So it's kind of this like uh, this teeter-totter balance mm -hmm. um, as to like what actions you're going to be able to take at what time, right. how are you going to build out your infrastructure, how are you going to get it surrounded so you can actually build a bridge, mm -hmm. and also build the right bridge at the right time to kind yes. of chain different things. Yeah, so those are the two sort of main aspects of the game. The action selection, uh, playing chicken portion where mm -hmm. it's sort of you meta gaming against your opponent. It's like there's and no then... way she's going to go down there and take all that resource. Mm -hmm. Oh, she did. Like... And then the whole yeah. planning part where uh -huh. you're trying to set yourself up with uh, planning conditions and then trying to meet them, trying to maximize them as best as you can. Mm -hmm. So the game is a, a little bit dry uh, as it per, yep. you know, typical like Rosenberg it. fashion yeah. in some of his games, mm -hmm. but uh, very, very, very good. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, the box says 45 plus definitely more into the plus category because <laughs> I've you have, we've never gotten this game played in uh, 45 or less. We have yeah, analysis no paralysis. I think yeah. we need to admit to that. We, we do. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, only when we're playing, I guess, together. Mm -hmm. But uh, the game also comes with different decks, and there are expansion decks, so you can sort of switch them out and see which version of the game you like to play with yep. because it's one of those games where the game that comes in the box is more of a system, mm -hmm. and then you can sort of mix or, or trade in the cards. Yep. So that was our number three, a very surprise hit for us both. Yep. This is Oranian Burger Canal. Okay, moving on to our number two game new to us from last year. This did not come out in 2023, mm -hmm. but it is a oldie but goodie from Uwe Rosenberg called Fields of Arl. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in this game, uh, this is a one to two player only game, so very similar to Oranian Burger Canal in that mm -hmm. sense, but also very different from that one. Uh, in this one, it's very kind of classic Uwe Rosenberg where you're going to be managing resources, managing different animals, mm -hmm. trying to... Uh, clear out your personal player board so that it can be built upon by different types of buildings so you can have your own asymmetric kind of uh, engine or kind of game. Yes, this is sort of a hodgepodge of a lot of the different mechanisms that you see uh, in Uwe Rosenberg games. Uh, there's the farming, uh, well, no, no, there's no farming, you right? Use animals, though. There's, there's byproducts yep. that you're making, and essentially, in this game, you have a board. And the big kicker with Fields of Arl is the board is divided into two sides, depending on where you are in the game. You have the summer side and then the winter side, and the game is going to alternate between the two. Uh, because the actions are actually different. Yeah, there's a certain set of actions. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry about that. There's a certain set of actions specifically when you're in the summer phase mm -hmm. and a certain set of actions when you're in the winter phase. Yes, and technically it is it is a worker placement game because on one side of the board, it lays out all the different types of actions and only one person can take each action per round. Mm -hmm. But once per round, somebody can jump ship and take an action on the other side of the board. So it really depends on what you've been building up because this game is sort of like A Feast for Odin in the sense that it's a bit sandbox Mm -hmm. you can figure out a strategy and sort of go down that path and then play it again later and go down a different path. Totally, yeah. And so all of these opportunities that you're making for them for yourself really depends on what path you've been taking mm -hmm. throughout the game. And so uh, when we played this game, I really felt like there are a lot of similarities to A Feast for Odin, which is one of my favorite games from Uwe Rosenberg, without all of the polyomino uh, laying on your board, which is what is very, uh, very iconic of that, one. of that game. Yeah. So each player has their own board that you're trying to build things on uh, to sort of create your engine. And you're also making and shipping animal products mm -hmm. and creating vehicles. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, but it was the first time that we played it and we yeah. both really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, there is an expansion that I believe adds a third player. We have not uh, played that one. That one was super out of print for a very long time. And I believe it is now back in print. So we are keen to try that one out as well. That is our number two from last year. That is Fields of Aural. All right. And finally, moving into our number one uh, top favorite new twist game from 2023. This is Anachrony. Uh, yes. But it's not just Anachrony. <laughs> this is actually <laughs> Anachrony with the Fractures of Time expansion. Right. 
Uh, we don't have a box that just resembles Fractures of Time. All of our Anachrony products, I guess, are all in this Infinity box. So this is our representative. <laughs> but uh, this is a game that was designed by David Turksey with Richard Amon and Victor Peter and published by Mind Clash Games. And the expansion, which is the first main expansion to come out, I believe, for the I game, so. mm -hmm. is called Fractures of Time, which came out a couple of years ago. But last year was the first time that we were able to fully explore it. And wow, that really changes the game. Yeah, I had not played Fractures of In Time until last year, getting ready to do the Mind Clash uh, Anachrony series that mm -hmm. we ended up doing. And so uh, a lot of people were saying for many, many, uh, for years telling me like, if you're gonna play it, make sure you play it with the Fractures of Time. So. Uh, it's very, very good. Uh, if you're not familiar with Anachrony, this is a game that has a lot of lore to it, so we, <laughs> maybe we won't touch upon the theme too much, yeah. but it's basically a worker placement game where players are trying to uh, build buildings on their player board, you're placing out your your workers in mech suits, mech suits if, you, yeah. if you have the suits, I guess, and then placing it out onto the main board. The original base game had just a certain, a limited number of spots on the main game board where you can actually go to, mm -hmm. but with the Fractures of Time expansion, it basically makes it so that you can hop around and take more and more actions and it makes the game a lot deeper yeah it really added extra elements to the game there's a whole other board where you can take different types of actions get mm -hmm. different types of resources uh, there's a whole new type of uh, worker type that has the ability to kind of warp and uh, i can't remember the exact term for uh blink blinking yes yes that can blink and help you uh, take uh, more actions because in, in the base game once somebody was kind of on a spot that was it, that spot is done. Mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, in this new one, if maybe I was on a spot and I'm camping on there for a very long time, but I wanna take an additional action, I could blink with that worker, go to a different location, mm -hmm. but what I've done now is opened up the spot I was on before. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of this like balance as to like when is the right time to leave a spot so that it's, it's most advantageous for me and so that the action spot that I'm now opening up is not the most advantageous for your opponent. And uh, it's a really, really fun game. I think I like it best at three players because uh, the board state is kind of a, a lot of like kind of parts where everything is kind of moving at the same time. Uh, in two players, it's a little bit more open, mm -hmm. uh, but a really, really fantastic game. Yeah, and even even if the expansion only adds just a few more elements, those elements make a huge difference on the gameplay experience mm -hmm. uh, coming from the base game. There's just so much more that you can do and so much more that you have to consider. So anyway, that is the form of Anachrony that we both uh, prefer to I play with from now pretty on, much yeah. every single time we're we We're going to be incorporating it. it every time. And uh, we are both very, very impressed by it. So that is why it is our number one uh, new to us game of 2023. That go. is Anachrony with the Fractures of Time expansion. Well, there you have it. Those were our top 10 favorite new to us games from 2023 that were not released <laughs> in 2023, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but as per usual, we would love to hear what your favorite games were. We did not get to play as many games as we would have hoped, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. in the past year. So we're going to make a valiant effort to play more games this That's year. That's right. Yeah, we have plenty of other ones. I'm sure um, uh, you've seen maybe on some other lists uh, out there. There's uh, Kutno Horror that we still would love to play. Um, Evacuation. Evacuation was one that that um, I've heard a lot of good things about. So this obviously is not a comprehensive list. We have not had the opportunity to play mm -hmm. all the different titles that came out last year. So hopefully over the next couple months, we can kind of trickle in a couple here and there. So we would love to hear what your favorite games were so that we can uh, get them on our radar as well. Yep. And now we can finally officially begin 2024. That's right. The new season begins. Yes. So again, Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.